1 Samuel chapter 17, in verse number 29, at this point we've seen Goliath come up in the battle between Israel and the Philistines, Goliath coming out every, on the, for 40 days, and he's challenging the armies of Israel, and he's defying the armies of God, and uh, David providentially is sent to God about this, sent to the battle at this time, and David something inside him stirs. And this is where I want to get to this morning. I feel sorry for people that never stir on the inside. They're just coasting through life and nothing ever grips them. Nothing ever stirs them up. The Bible said when Paul came into Athens that his spirit was stirred within him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. I think it's a time in America when we watch things like what happened yesterday with this march that our spirit would be stirred within us. To fight the fight of faith. To stand up for truth. To go into battle. We need people that are stirred. And here's the, one of the secrets to David's life. Was when David saw wickedness and wrongdoing, he got stirred. Let me tell you something. If you don't get stirred for the righteous things, you'll probably get stirred up by the devil, devil for wrong things. You need to be careful about what you get stirred up for. Make sure it's right and that it's biblical. But David comes down and of course he comes to his brethren and he asks, what will be done to the man that kills us? And he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And of course, when his brothers hear that, they begin to mock and scorn and disdain him. And we preached on this last week. But this week, I want to preach on David's response to that. And you find in verse 29 where it says, and David said, what have I now done? And here's the text, is there not a cause? And I realize this passage has been preached on through American history, and I'm glad that it has. Because it's this little phrase right here, is there not a cause, that's probably most of American history has hinged on as far as a passage of Scripture that aroused people in this nation from what they knew in the past and what they had come from in Europe and other countries and aroused them to realize there was a cause. And so I want to preach this morning on this subject of the power of a righteous and biblical cause. The power of a righteous and biblical cause. I consider this phrase to be one of the most important phrases in the entire Bible. It creates action. It creates the motivation, the impetus to get something done. If you look in Webster's old 1812 dictionary, the word cause says it's the reason or motive that urges one or moves one or impels the mind, the spirit, the soul, the body to act and decide. You see, it's just like this morning. If your little child fell off the seat that he's sitting on and you moved, you don't even think there's a cause that moved you into action. We could talk about the cause that you have for your family. for your And, and basically, a lot of the cause is a biblical cause based upon love. But it's that which, a cause is that which produces an effect. And I want you to remember this. In the New Testament and even in the Old Testament, there is a, there's a synonym that embodies this. And it's the word sake. S-A-K-E. And whenever the Bible talks about for Christ's sake, for love's sake, for the gospel's sake, for this one's sake, what that's saying is for that cause, for the cause of the gospel. The Bible talks about for the truth's sake. And every person needs to think about this little word, for sake. What's, for what sake are you doing? And for what sake, why are you doing what you're doing? God wants us to get a hold of these things. A cause gets down inside your soul. A cause moves a person to action. It moves a person to battle and to warfare. It has been often said that soldiers on a battlefield get to where that the cause of the nation is no longer valid to them. It's only about each other. And I can understand that. It's all just about survival. It's not about being patriotic anymore. It's about getting through this thing. But truly and honestly, there has to be causes even higher than that. And that's what really gets things done. This one thing in, uh, this one thing in the life of one young man in this passage of Scripture turned the total course of history. And I want to tell you this. If you get a biblical righteous cause in your heart and your life, it can turn your history. Totally pivot your history the moment a biblical righteous cause comes into your heart. Because that cause will stir your heart, move your heart, motivate your... What, what, 
What is it that causes a missionary to go to some place, abandon the opportunities of making money and having all this and having that and having all the American dream? What is it that says to him to go to some place and spend his life giving the gospel of Jesus Christ to people? It is a biblical righteous cause is the cause of God's glory, the cause of, of souls, the cause of love is the cause of, of salvation, of course. And these cause move people to do things. And can I say to you this? This biblical principle is seemingly almost absent from the Christian church now. There was a time in America when it was not unusual for people to be called to the mission field. And they were called because they had a cause placed in their heart by the Holy Ghost of God. A cause will move people people into action. And I want to tell you what's really going on. While a Christian church is losing its cause, it seems like Satan's group has... What were those women all doing yesterday? Marching up and down the streets with signs in their hands. They had an unbiblical, unrighteous, evil cause. And what we're seeing is Satan is stirring the cause up in people that is unrighteous. And I say it's a time for revival. And I'm challenging you today. I want to tell you right now, I wouldn't be in this pulpit 35 years later if I didn't have a cause down in here. There's been many a time I don't feel good. Many a time I'm discouraged. Many a time I don't even know how I'm going to go on. I don't even know what God is doing. I don't know why God is doing it. But there is a cause for the glory of God that has kept me motivated down through my, and though my failures and my stupidity and the idiocy of sometimes of my own fleshliness, there's still a cause that motivates me to want to get up and go again every Monday morning and every Sunday morning and keep going for God. And I'm praying that the Holy Ghost of God would put in the hearts of people here today. There is, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? But then we have to do this. We have to define that cause. We have to narrow it down. We have to realize, is it biblical? Is it righteous? Is it mixed up? And so this one cause that David had, it changed the course of the battle and it changed the course of history. As I've said, there are righteous biblical causes. They spring forth from God's love every time. A righteous biblical cause always springs out of the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. There are unrighteous and unbiblical and evil causes. And they're innumerable across history and they're around us today. They are based out of selfishness and Satanism. Then thirdly, there's this, and I want you to key in here. There are good causes, quote, but they're not necessarily critical causes or they're maybe not necessarily biblical causes. And you need to be very careful that you weigh up and determine and decide in your life whether you're going to go for good causes or for biblical causes. This gets many people trapped. Causes can be used to mislead people, to deceive people, and to steal from people. There are causes that raise money. There are people who use good causes such as starving children to build money out of people. There are people who preach, the, who preach with the intent to build money out of people. And what they do is take a supposed good cause, weld it and synchronize it to an evil cause and use it for deception. I think you understand what I'm talking about. And also to produce ungodly results. Unholy wicked causes can be united with good causes to accomplish evil ends. Let me give you a real illustration that you have experienced in your life. In the 1950s and 60s in America, we had what was called the Civil Rights Movement. It was a cause. It was based upon these things. In the South particularly, they had what's called Jim Crow laws. I did not grow up around Jim Crow laws. I, I really don't understand. But here's what it was. If you were black, you had to ride in the back of the bus. You could not sit in the front of the bus. If you were black, you could not go into white restaurants. You could not drink at white Uh, fountains and you could not in other words there was a segregated it was called Jim Crow laws black people and white people both developed a cause to try to rid the nation of Jim Crow laws and to try to elevate the nation in practice to live out what the constitution said all right that every person had a right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and that we're created equal and that there are not substandard substandard people all right now, I'm going to tell you something right now. We're in a very deceptive area because I am not a follower of the de- definition of what people call racist right now. Yeah. Let me tell you something. If what this world is saying is racist right now, then the God you claim to be worshiping is a racist. He told the people of Israel, stay separated from everybody else. Don't intermingle with them. Don't intermarry with them. And don't have anything to do with the rest of that crowd. 
And the fact when they violated, that's when they got in trouble with God. So we need to make sure we're we're understanding when we say racist. Let me tell you something. There are people you don't want your family around. There's places you don't want your kids raised in. There's stuff you don't want your children around. And it has nothing to do with the value of that person's soul. It's just the fact that I'm not raising my kids around a bunch of junk and slop and garbage just so somebody can say, oh, I'm not racist. Racist, the term racist has become more sinful than being an adulterer in America. The term racist has become more sinful than being a pedophile, than being a pervert sodomite. And I'm not standing for it. Just because I don't want to be around a bunch of rotten garbage and cultural, cultural living that I think is wicked does not make me a racist in the sense that they mean of. Now, there are causes, but here's what's happened. I literally, I agree with Martin Luther King's deal that men should be judged not by the color of his skin, but by the character of his heart. But you know what's funny? Right. How many knows that his, his, is it his, is his, his daughter right now that they interview quite a bit on the news? She voted for Trump. Do you know why? Because she's staying with what? Now, I'm not a big Martin Luther fan, King. We don't dismiss school here on his holiday. You know, I'm going to tell you why. Because they locked up his records for 50 years because they didn't want nobody to see it. Yeah. And I would tell you, if you've got nothing to hide, don't lock up your records. All right? I'm just being, I, I, listen, I got phone calls over this and I'll probably get phone calls. We'll send this out and I'm not scared of nobody. Okay. I'll get phone calls from people about it. And I've had them before, but that, you know, that's just too bad. I don't care if it's my uncle or your grandpa, right's right and wrong's wrong. But there are things that I agree with him about. And I do believe that he did have a good cause in the sense of it's not right for somebody because the color of their skin to have to sit in the back of a bus. Amen. I might get a good tan and have to go back there and sit. Right now, but here's what happened. A good cause, Jim, elimination of Jim Crow laws, got welded to women's rights law, cause. I'm going to find out how many of you build the Bible here in a little bit. Okay. Women's rights movement historically has never been a biblical cause. They've united with a few things, but what they did, and I'll show you how this thing moves. I'm, a, I'm all for, let me tell you something. The greatest women's rights movement you'll ever experience is in this book right here. I cannot believe that those women yesterday who claim they're for women's rights are promoting Muslim immigrants in this country when they'd have to all be wearing burqas if Muslim come in this country. That's stupid. And I can't even understand how them women's rights talk about the queers and the Muslims. Does anybody know what the Muslims do to queers? Boom! Over with. The only people that whole bunch is against is Bible-believing Christians. That's the only bunch they're truly against. They're all united against Bible-believing Christians. Can I tell you, the greatest freedom that women have ever enjoyed in this world came straight out of this book, where husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And I'm going, I'm, I, I can't got time to tell you all what's going on. God's going to start. I, we, I listen, the new, new radio broadcast starts two weeks from today, I think it is. But I've already, we've already got another ministry going. It's wild. I've never seen nothing like that. I ain't got enough energy time. I need help. Amen. I mean, God has opened up so many doors, you cannot believe it. I want to tell you something. There's a, there's a door open for truth in this country. I promise you that. There really is. I, I got to keep rolling. Please help me. Get, but here's what I want to get to. Now, all of a sudden, you got civil rights coming up through here. Civil rights movement has some legitimacy, okay? But now what's it been joined to? Sodomite movement. The civil rights movement has now joined hip and thigh. And every Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson, Bozo up there, Bozo Black, sellouts, they'll call anybody that stands up for anything, they'll call him an Uncle Tom, and they're yoking up with the queers. Now, I'm going to tell you black congressmen and you black senators something right now. You sold out Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King would have never joined up with a bunch of sodomites marching up and down the street. And you've legitimized one of the awfulest sins in the world by joining up and hooking the civil rights movement up there. There's a difference between being judged by the color of your skin and by the conduct of your immorality. And you don't connect my skin color. I'm going to tell you something. Just because a man's skin color does not alleviate the sin of his wickedness. And they're making him a civil rights issue when they're not a civil rights issue. It is a sin issue. It is not a sin to be black. It's not a sin to be white. It's not a sin to be Asian. But it is a sin to be a sodomite. Now you see how causes get all mixed up? And how causes get all joined together and the devil knows the power of a cause. And I'm telling you what, we need to distinguish and articulate these and separate them and make sure they're understood right. Now, there are, as I said, there are 
wicked and unwise causes. This cause of illegal immigration is a wicked and unwise and unlawful cause. It is not right to want people to be able to violate the Constitution and our borders to come in this country illegally. We have a legal immigration process. We, they, everybody ought to come in the same way. We're giving them special treatment, superior. What makes a Mexican, what makes a Mexican person superior to a European person who comes through proper channels? We're giving superiority. We're not giving equal rights. We're giving superior rights. We're saying you can break the law, and if you're a lawbreaker, we give you special rights. That's wrong. Somebody needs to say it. It is wrong. It's unlawful. You cannot have a nation with it. And then there's the, uh, the, there's the deal of abortion. And there's both sides. And I'm telling you, here's one of the big things you want to watch with causes. And that is the verbiage and the wordage that they use. Being pro-choice means you're a pro, in this country now means you're a pro-killer. But they use nice words. Now, I'm, listen, I'm against abortion and I think it's a great cause. But it's not the primary cause. And all these other issues that we talked about. Social justice and this, that, and the other. There's some good causes. Abortion, as I said, is a good cause. Pregnancy, help, helping those that are wet, pregnant out of wedlock. And all these things are good. Uh, having a cause for drug addiction, uh, alcohol addiction, homelessness, uh, cancer, uh, diseases, and so forth. Uh, all these, those are good causes. You can get involved in them. And I encourage you to get involved in them. But do not make any of these your primary cause or it'll fade away and blow up on you. Listen to me good. David is going to show you how the power of God comes when a person recognizes the primary cause of all other causes, of good causes. We can talk about the cause of education. That's been a big cause with me for 30 some years. I'm pouring my heart into it right now. I want to leave. I literally want to leave a work that can go on for the next generations of Christian and godly education where Christ is the center of education. It is a cause with me. It is a cause that I live for. I'm willing to die for. It is not a little thing. It is very important. Let me tell you, where do you think that all those women yesterday, like, like Ashley Judd, who gets up there and it's Madonna. Let me tell you something. I was preaching 30 some years ago against Madonna and her, her, her album, Like a Virgin. I was preaching against it in this church. And I'm telling you something. People would mock me and people would scoff me. And people talked about how I shouldn't say things like that. And she's standing up there now talking about blowing up the White House 35 years later. That's anarchy. If that had been a conservative, she'd already been arrested by the Secret Service for threatening to blow up the White House. I've had thoughts about blowing up the White House. That is a personal admission to anarchy. But where do you think all them women got in their head the stuff they believed they were touting yesterday? Where do you think they got that at? Where did they learn those, those philosophies at? They got them from the devil. Where was most of it really inculcated into their minds at? School. You can believe that or not. And you have a choice to either embrace them or reject them. I realize that. Most of that's pumped through their educational process, whether you want to believe that or not. And then secondarily, by the media in the culture, it reinforces it for them. Conservation is a great cause. Natural resources is a great cause. Child abuse is a great cause. Starvation, orphans and widows are great causes, but they're not the primary cause. And I've got a purpose in doing what I'm doing here to show you. There is a something I learned out of here that I will never forget in my life. And it excites me and thrills me. And it makes me now understand why Christians have lost battles for the last 40 years in this country. All good causes are secondary causes and come about because of the neglect of the primary cause. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you have a cause? Do you have a primary cause? I mean, the primary core cause of your whole existence and purpose in life. And do you have secondary causes that issue out of the primary cause of your life? Secondary causes are only worthwhile and are only valuable to the extent that they spring out of the primary cause. You have your Bibles in 1 Samuel 17. The primary biblical cause is found in David's statement. In chapter 17 and verse number 10, we find out what brought him and what lifted out and exposed his cause. He said in verse number 10, the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. There is a statement that Goliath made. I defy the armies of Israel this day. When David heard that, the primary cause of his life became lifted out of his chest. And I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Ghost of God can put this in you like it did David. And God can use you as a David against the Goliaths of our time. 
When you get to chapter 17 and verse 26, you're going to find him. Now he exposes and reveals what his primary cause is. Here it is. In the last part of that verse, it says this. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? What is he addressing? He is addressing the fact that Goliath earlier said, I defy the armies of the living God. David quoted that when he lifted out the primary cause. Now I want you to think, what is David's primary cause? Think with me. I want you to get, I don't want you to, I don't want to just preach this. I want you to start asking yourself, what is David's primary cause? Because when you get this one in you, you'll have power like David had to change the course of history. Look in verse number 45. And verse, and it said, then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Look in verse number 46. This day, the Lord will deliver thee into mine hand. Think about what he's saying here. He didn't say this day, I'm going to, I'm going to knock your head off or I'm going to cut your head off. This day, the Lord will deliver thee into my hand. I will smite thee and take thine head from thee and give the carcasses to the host of Philistines. This day, the fowls of the earth and to the wild beasts of the earth. And here is his primary cause. And here's the primary cause of all causes that are worthwhile. This is the biblical cause that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. There's the primary cause. Now I want to ask you this this morning. Why are you doing what you're doing? And I want to tell you this. When you come to the end of the road of your life, if you don't have that cause, the glory of God, everything else you're doing is just going to kind of fade off into nothingness. Everything I'm doing, everything you're doing, the vital question will be at the end of the road of your life is what you're doing for the glory of God and his glory alone. Did you know the Bible said that he will share his glory with none other? The Bible says, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Did you know the Bible said that you and I were created for the glory of God? Some people wonder, why is it that God allowed David to win such a victory? And why is it so oftentimes God's people suffer defeat at the hands of their enemy? It has to do with the recognition of the primary cause. You never one time catch David talking about self-glory, puffing himself up what I'm going to do, what this is going to make me, how this is going to advance me, how this is going to make me look in people's eyes, how this is going to benefit me. Everything David said from the get-go was about, you defied the armies of God. You defied the armies of God. And he said, God is going to deliver you into my hand and he's going to do it for a reason, for his glory. And he's going to do it to show the whole earth that there's a God in Israel. And the day that you and I start raising our families for the glory of God and not so everybody thinks we're something. The day that we start preaching for the glory of God. The day that we start witnessing for the glory of God. The day we start running our businesses for the glory of God. The day that we start doing our work for the glory of God. The day that we start doing everything unto the glory of God is the day God's going to run a great victory through our lives. And that's a fact. If you don't believe it, you'll never see nothing. It's to those that believe. Verse 47, all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, underline it. His motivation was for the glory of God. This is the cause from all other righteous causes come from. This is what we can fight and die for. All other causes will fade away. David had what we call the eternal cause, and that is the eternal glory of God Almighty. You and I were not saved to serve ourselves. We were saved to serve God and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. David had this critical issue. Now, I, please listen to me. I'm preaching you with all my heart. I'm not up here joking around. David had this critical issue squared away in his heart. It's evident by what he said to everybody that came in contact with him. There was one purpose here, and that was for the glory of God. Now, watch this. David also realized that God, David lived by faith. And faith is the victory. Now watch, you say, Reggie, how's that? Anybody in here, let's have a Bible lesson. What did God, what did God tell the children of Israel that he would do for them when they came into the land? They come out of Egypt. They're 40 years in the wilderness. And they're getting ready to go into land. What does God say? And, and the, remember the, the guys went in there, the spies went in there, and they said, there's giants in there. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight. 
Those 10 men that told that line of nonsense never did make it in. The only two out of the whole deal above 20 years old was the two men who believed what God said. What had God said? What did God say to him? He said, I'm going to give you the land and I'll conquer those people. I'll go in with you and before you and I'll send hornets in front of you and I'll defeat those people and there'll be as nothing in front of you and I will conquer the land and I will give you the land. Do you know what the real secret was? That little boy was the only guy in the whole country that believed the Bible. It's that simple. He believed the Bible. He walked by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. And David said, I don't care how big he is. I don't care how tough he looks. I don't care what they're saying. He's saying that God is a liar. He has defined the word of God. And I'm going to believe God if it kills me. And God looked down and the Bible said the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for those whose hearts are turned perfect toward him that he may show himself strong on their behalf. I tell you, God's still waiting. God is still waiting for somebody to say, you know what? I don't believe that book. I don't care what it looks like. My God doesn't lie to nobody. If God, he was, see, he was, let me, here's the secret. He wasn't just lifting some deal he wanted to accomplish out of nothing and said, well, my God's going to be with me. No, he's waiting. He said, wait a minute. God recorded. God put his word on the line that he would defeat those people. That's why David said the battle is the Lord's. It wasn't his to win. You know what I really think maybe, maybe went through David's mind, Kenny? I'm going to prove God. I'm just going, at, at a young boy, I'm just going to figure out whether God's real or not. I'm going, to say, I'm going to find out if God's a man of his word. And by the way, if he's not a man of his word, I'm out of here. But if he's a man of his word, I'm willing. Can I tell you that God probably bring you and I and all of us to those places in our life? Watch, listen to this. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. Did you know that God's not afraid of you proving him? But here's the secret. You better be sure that you can anchor what you're claiming on his word. Don't start doing stuff and saying stuff that God never said. That'll get you in big trouble. And that's why we're seeing defeat. We got some little penny any preacher gets up and said, God told me this. While he's watching pornography, not hardly. We're not talking about junk here. We're talking about the, the difference between life and death. This primary cause, this eternal cause. It is for God's glory. I want to just say this. The primary cause David had was for God's glory. The secondary causes that comes out of that primary cause are some of them that are biblical and righteous and right are this. The salvation of souls. I'm telling you this. That is to me is, is, I mean, if it's not about seeing people get saved, what on earth are we here for? I don't want people to go to hell. And people that aren't saved go to hell. By the way, if you're, if you're here this morning and you're not born again, I want to tell you something. How old is Mr. Restick that you talked about a while ago? In his 60s? Somebody said maybe 60s. Let me, you know, this guy's probably having, I'm going to tell you right now, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what another day may bring forth. You don't know whether you'll ever sit in another church service or not. You don't know but what your casket sitting at the funeral home right now. You don't know but the diesel that they'll dig your grave with the backhoe is, not in, the, is in the tank right now. You don't know but the flowers that's going to adorn your casket are already up at the floor shop. I am telling you there's not a soul in this building, including me, that knows whether you'll be back to tomorrow or not. And I'm going to tell you this. If you die without Jesus Christ, you'll bust hell wide open. And somebody needs to love you enough and tell you that. Don't play with your soul. Did you know what God said? God said today. Is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. God doesn't owe you another three seconds. Did you know that if you're lost, you right now in your seat could ask God to save you? Did you know that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? You say, Reggie, what are you talking about? I've given my life to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that people would be saved. That is a secondary cause. And if that's not a cause, you'd name me one that is. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. And let me say this, the day the church gets on it, it's first primary cause to glorify God. It's next cause, secondary cause to preach the gospel to every creature. That's what Jesus said to do, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And the secondary cause of my heart, and that's why I constantly try to get this church, listen, let's get the gospel out every way we can. Stop and pick you some tracks up, get you some CDs, do what you can, get you a cause to live for cause to reach souls for Jesus Christ. I'm sick and I'm sick to death of Christian people want to fight, argue and fuss 
over non-issues while people died and going to hell. All they want to talk about something they don't like that went on and they've not witnessed to a soul in 14 years. That's sickening. People dying and going to hell. And all they want to do is fuss and feud. Good grief. You know what the problem is? They've lost their cause. They've lost your cause. The proclaiming of the word of God. And again, I'm going to tell you something about salvation of souls. That has to be done for God's glory. You can't be going around talking about how many people you led to Jesus. If you are, you're about your glory and not his. I tell you, we're not up here with spiritual pistols putting notches on something every time we lead somebody to Christ. We're just servants. We're just beggars telling others where we found bread. And I beg of you in Jesus' name, get saved from the seat. There's people in this building today. You're lost without God. Your heart was quit beating. Your bust tail wide open. You need to get saved. It's not for our glory. It's not for my glory. I'm not going to run around and say, Oh, I bless God, I led so-and-so to Christ, or so-and-so got saved through my preaching. That's nonsense. I don't want you to die and go to hell. It is just that simple. Our motives have got to be for And you know something? When people get saved, that brings glory to God. Right? The proclaiming of God's word to all people concerning every issue. Now, we're talking here past now. All right, somebody gets saved. They're a Christian. God says, Preach the word. Preach the whole counsel of God. Let me tell you, that's a primary, that's one of the primary motivational cause I have in life. Is I have a burden every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, to get the word of God out to God's people. To get it across the airways, to get it on the internet, to get it everywhere I can. People need answers about their marriages. They need answers about raising their kids. They need answers about anger. They need, that's why I'm having these videos in here. People need help. And help, true, lasting, eternal help comes from the word of God. And we've got to just publish, publish, publish the word of God everywhere we can. That has to be a good cause. It is a wonderful biblical cause he said he said go into all the world with the word of god then there's righteous causes in laws and government in laws and government we need to take our faith and move it into to to uh, to uh, our, our government and into our laws our laws about marriage our laws about parental rights yeah did you know france just recently had a national law enacted that you cannot no longer whip your children you cannot use corporal punishment no longer in France. If a parent does it, they're a criminal. Can I tell you that if we don't stand up in our legislative chambers, in our judicial chambers in this country, that those people that's marching yesterday in Washington which will try to have it, they would love to make it where you and I cannot discipline our children. They know that if you and I can, you know what the devil knows? That if you don't train and discipline your children, they're going to grow up hellions and rebels against God. And that's just a fact. Righteous laws. Let me give you a further cause, and that's the cause of the church. It's the pillar. You know what the Bible says about the church? It's the pillar and ground of truth. You realize what an impactful statement that is? That's what your Bible said. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. You know what? I'm, I'm shocked at the, at the little value that people have on the church. Let me tell you something. Your forefathers weren't like that. They moved into communities. They cut off a piece of land. They all met over there and dug the foundation, put the rocks down, built the building, and said, we're going to have a church in the middle of this community. Let me tell you something else. They said, we're going to have school here Monday through Friday or whatever it was. We're going to have church here on Sundays. And this is going to be the center of our community. And this is going to be the pillar and ground of truth. Right here is where the truth about God and about life and about laws and about good justice and about home and about marriage and about business is going to be issued from the pillar and ground of truth. And I'm glad that God sent people in this country and they built these little old country churches. And I grieve when I drive by a community and the church's doors are shut because nobody cared about the church. No cause. I'll tell you what, they're, I mean, you know what? they're more concerned about the stupid cemetery than they are the church of God. Woo! We're having a good time now. They're more concerned the flowers be on Willie's tombstone than they are about the gospel being preached in the church house. Isn't that sick? Oh, I mean, if the gate hinge breaks, man, I'll run down there and fix that cemetery gate. The old church house can go down. Isn't that sad? Let me tell you something. Don't you ever in your life underestimate the value of the church. Jesus Christ purchased it with his own blood. He bought his bride with his own blood. And he's coming after the church. You can say what you want to. God's glory. The church for God's glory. There is a constant war against the church. Then there's the cause of our families. And surely that ought to be a natural cause that would come in the heart of any man, whether he's saved or lost, that he ought to love his wife and children and care about keeping his family together and so forth. The cause of our country the cause of our constitution, the cause of liberty, the cause of freedom and justice and patriotism in our land. We need, these are good causes, but they're secondary causes because, let me tell you something, those people marching yesterday would tell you that they're patriotic too. 
they would tell you, however upside down and reprobate minded they would be, that they love the Constitution too. But just like FDR said after he took the oath, I swore as I see the Constitution, not as they see it. However twisted it may be, we need to understand that there is a cause for true patriotism, true adherence to the Constitution and the values of this nation. Right now, my mom and dad told me this past week about when they went on a tour several years ago to Valley Forge, and they were taking a tour back east on a bus tour. Got into Valley Forge up there, and the, tour, the, the guy that was doing the deal told him, said, all that stuff you read about in school, about Washington and all them, there, and the soldiers and their feet being wrapped up in bleeding snow and didn't have any food and warmth, that's all a big lie. Yeah, that's what a government-paid tour guide at Valley Forge told him. Let me tell you what's going on. They're right, rewriting history in this nation. Did you know what George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin, all those men are made out to be now? White, chauvinist, white, pig, male slave owners. That's how they're being caricaturized now in American history. This is one school's not going to let it happen. We're going to honor our founding fathers. We're not saying they were right about everything. We're not saying that they, it's not a divine document. But it's the best I've ever seen. It's a human document. But we're not going to let them characterize our founding fathers as a bunch of white. I'm going to tell you something. Can I just tell you something? I ain't got no problem being white. I ain't got any problem. Yep, I'm white. Glad I am. I ain't, ain't, I ain't got anything against those that aren't, but I'm not going to get cowed down, intimidated, and, and feel bad because I'm white. That's stupid. Thank you. I know that don't pass over. I can tell you what, I'm, that makes some old lesbian preacher squeal like a hog, wouldn't it? I'm going to tell you something. I ain't, I ain't got no, I'm going to tell you something. You, you better watch your attitude about who God is because I'm going to tell you, you know your God is a God of wrath and he's coming to destroy all this filth and this wickedness and these lies and this stuff. If you think I'm rough, you ain't seen nothing. To you seeing God come and destroy this stuff. That's a fact. I tell you, God ain't putting up with this nonsense. And I'll tell you right now, the church better stop this political correctness. Yeah. And if there ain't anything else I like about Donald Trump is he ain't very political correct. Amen. And I'll tell you what, that's eating their lunch up. I'm enjoying the fight. In fact, I'm wanting to go up and hip. Go up and, I'm just telling you something. It's pitiful. I'm, go, I'm tell you what, I'm, I, I don't, listen, I, I've got grandkids said here, I don't tend to let the liberals just shove over them, the godless un, 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 people like that. The cause of education, the cause of truth, this media and culture warfare. I got tickled as Sean Spicer saying last night and wherever it was, had a little news, had a little news conference. They got a shock. He walked in and said, there's two things I want to tell you. He said, you put out lying news yesterday. One is you said that we took out the bust of Martin Luther King out of the Oval Office. We didn't know such a thing. You lied. You put out false news. Number two, he said, you cropped the photos of the crowd to make it look like there wasn't hardly anybody here. You lied. And then he said this, yes, you need to hold us accountable, but accountability goes two ways. It's glad to see somebody finally put up and fight against this nonsense and this, 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 this. by the way, you talk about Hitlerism, the propaganda stuff like that's what Hitlerism is. Does anybody realize I'm stirred up? I'm going to tell you something. God called preaching is a constant and continual taking up in a fight for righteous causes. God called biblical preaching is a constant fight. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. He called us to a warfare. He said, our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's what needs to happen. Did you know why they're opposing Betsy DeVos as secretary of education? Because they're afraid their stronghold is going to get pulled down. That's what they're afraid of. I could go on. But let me say this to you. Beware of carrying godless causes. Beware of carrying worthless, wicked, temporal causes that will have no value at the end of your life. People in general, and I want you young people to listen to me right now. Youth in general have a tendency to some point from about 16 years old to about 24 to 26 have a tendency to want to pick up a cause. They do. They're looking for a cause for why am I here? What am I supposed to do? And I want to tell you, young people, you be very, very careful about make sure that your cause that you pick up is righteous, that's biblical, so God can bless it. Satan will fill the void if you're not careful with stupid, foolish, unwise, wicked, temporal causes. The tree hugger. I mean, can you imagine coming before the judgment seat of God and he said, what would you do with your life? I, I climbed up a tree and hugged it for three days. The environment, animal rights, PETA, carrying signs for marijuana. You know, don't, don't kill a man who's raped and killed 42 people. Death penalty. All these causes are all over the country. They're stupid, perver perverted causes. But here's one I want to tell you something. 
What's this devil backdoor deal? Often youth will out of rebellion in their heart to God and their parents and to truth get pulled into an unrighteous cause. I've seen it happen over and over and over again. You sit in this church, young people, I'm going to give you a prophetic warning. Not that I have some prophecy. It's, it's a scriptural, biblical life principle. That if you don't embrace the truth and the causes of truth and righteousness, you very likely will embrace causes that are wicked and ungodly. Because of rebellious attitude and spirit toward authority, you never yielded to God and his glory for your life. It was about you. Or, secondly, you may take up an unrighteous cause just to get attention. Well, my whole family believes this, so I'm going to believe total opposite to make mom and dad. I hate mom and dad. I'm bitter at mom and dad. I'm bitter at the church, so I'm going to become a Jehovah Witness so they can all, I've got all their attention. They're going to talk about me at every family gathering. How perverse and stupid is that? You become a pawn of the devil. Don't let bitterness and rebellion make you turn you into a lost cause. By the way, that'll be a lost cause. And then thirdly, sometimes youth take up a cause just to be accepted within the groups of the people they're around. They just want to belong to somebody, want to belong to some cause, and feel like that they're part of the in group. So be careful about those things. We all should have causes. The primary cause is what? God's glory. God's glory. The primary cause is God's glory. I want you to think it through. I want you to think about the implications of what it means in your business, your occupation, your work, your marriage, your family, your home. I think about right now myself, is my home glorifying to God? Are the things that's in my home glorifying to God? And if, so, if they're not, can God then bless my home if I'm not glorifying him? Can he show himself strong on my behalf if I'm hiding and keeping stuff in my life and heart that's not glorifying to God? The practical applications. And then I want you to think about the cost of it. Salvation is free to you, but glorifying God in your life is not going to come cheap. It's going to cost you some things. It's going to cost you some friends. It's going to cost you some relationships. It's going to cost you some opportunities. But he'll write the last chapters. It'll be worth it all when you see Christ. The secondary causes, they'll work out fine if you keep your first primary cause aligned with God. There's many, many references, and I'm going to do this on a, uh, uh, on a different time, about the word sake, S-A-K-E. When you get into the New Testament especially, think about this one even in the Old Testament, Psalms 23. He leadeth me through the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. If you study this word, it'll bless your heart. I was meditating on all these scriptures about for his sake, for the gospel's sake, for the truth's sake, for righteousness' sake. It's like God said, Reggie, you haven't got it yet. You're 63 years old and you still don't have it. That everything should be for my glory's sake, the righteousness' sake, the truth's sake, the gospel's sake, for his sake. We ought to live for Jesus' sake. Think about this one here. He said, Ephesians 4.32 let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away. And he said, forgiving one another, even as God forgave you for Christ's sake. You see the primary cause? There's got to be a cause down inside. Now I'm going to close with just giving you an illustration that happened in American history. How we lost a great, great Goliath battle because a man did not have the primary cause. And I want you to know before I tell you this that I am no way demeaning this man. He was a great Christian in American history. A great, great man in history. But he had a missing element that caused him to be defeated and caused great defeat to America. And it happened in a little town called Dayton, Tennessee. And it was a man by the name of William Jennings Bryan who had run for president three times. Who was considered to be the greatest orator. And at that time, considered to be the greatest defender of the Christian faith on American soil. He had traveled the country in different states, defending and promoting legislation to keep evolution from being taught in our schools. He had done a tremendous work for the Word of God and for the cause of Christ. I do not demean him by what I'm getting ready to tell you. But I've got the facts in front of me. I'm not telling you something I kind of think. I have the actual, uh, what do you call it, stenographic answers. He was pulled into a deal in Dayton, Tennessee, in the Scopes Monkey Trial, what's called. Most of you know about that history. Let me tell you something about these people with evil causes, like Clarence Darrell, 
They're what the Bible calls them. They're wolves, they're vipers, and they're dogs. And you never cast your pearls before swine. Your Savior said, do not do that. And Clarence Darrell pulled a very shrewd. That's why the Bible says the people of this world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. And I'm telling you, we need wisdom and biblical wisdom. But Clarence Darrell pulled it. See, they weren't interested in winning the case. They were interested in winning the larger war as it was being broadcast out to America to cause the fall of people's faith in the Bible. And I want you to listen to me very carefully, and I'll try to be brief. As this trial went on, he, Clarence Darrell said he asked for William Jennings Bryan to be put on the witness stand. Several people objected in the courtroom immediately, but William Jennings Bryan started nodding his head toward the judge. The judge was not going to allow it, but William Jennings Bryan not only assented to it, but approved of it. And the issue was this. Now, here's how they'll lie and trap you. Daryl agreed that he could be interrogated afterward. What he didn't tell him was that he was going to fold the case, yield, yield to lose the case, and, not, and, and kill the case and wouldn't, wouldn't allow himself to be put on. They put William Jennings Bryan on the, on the witness stand, and Dar- Clarence Daryl went after him. One of the things, are you listening to me right now? One of the things that he asked him as they approached, when he approached with, this, with his spear and his sword with his hand, was the issue of Bible translations. Why would Clarence Darrell, an agnostic, atheist, God-hater, have any concern about Bible? Why would he bring up Bible translations? What was he doing? He was attacking the veracity, the accuracy, and the dependability, and the preservation, and the inspiration of God's Word. He's not stupid. Attorneys know that if you say one thing here and you say another thing here, your whole testimony is blowed out of court. They'll throw you out so fast, make your head swim. So that's the first thing he did. William Jennings Bryan evaded it, didn't want to answer it. You know, he just kept answering in general terms. Darrell was whipping him. But then it came the awfulest. <clears throat> I'm not going to take you through the questions that he asked him about the age of the earth and the things that he said and so forth like that, which were totally off the wall. Didn't even realize he was being led down a trail. But pretty soon you come to grips with something. Brian didn't know the Bible like he said he did. He knew theological talk, but he did not know the Bible. The fact of it was that Clarence Darrell knew specifics in the Bible and used them better than he did. And here finally Mr. Darrell comes down to something. He says this. Do you think the earth was made in six days? Mr. Bryan, not in six days of 24 hours. Doesn't it say so? Mr. Darrell replied. Are you listening? Mr. Bryan, no, sir. Now, here's what is said by observers of the courtroom at this time. For a moment, a stunned silence pervaded the crowd. Mr. Bryan's supporters were appalled and his opponents mystified because he seemed to be saying that the creation, Genesis story could not be taken literal and was not true. Mr. Darrell, do you believe those were literal days? My impression is that they were periods, but I would not attempt to argue against anybody who wanted to believe in literal days. I'm not going to take you all through this. If you're interested sometime, go and find the documentation of the script and you won't have to ask anybody else what was said because they've got it all down stenographed. It's all said. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Williams, Jennings Bryan lost one of the greatest spiritual battles that was ever fought in this country. And here's why. He did not believe the word of God. He was trying to go along with all the theological. And here's the weird part about it is he had written articles defending or arguing against theistic evolution, which is an attitude that evolution and theology goes together, which is totally false. He had argued against that. But when pressed personally, he admitted under oath that he did not believe Genesis 1-1. And you know what happened? He was defeated. You cannot say on one side of your mouth, God, I'm your man, and I'll go into battle for you. Let me tell you what it proved, and I, I say this with, with fear and trembling. It is now 
viewed in history that Mr. Bryan was more interested in his personal glory and national prestige than he was in God's glory. And it was proved by the fact of his answers. Because God is never glorified when one of his own calls him a liar. This is David's secret. He had faith in the word of God. He believed it. And he acted upon it as a first cause. That God would protect and defend his own glory. And if he didn't, he's not God at all. And he just will to find out. But David went in faith upon the word of God. Giving God the glory. And God defeated Goliath through David. God is waiting now. I want to I commend Franklin Graham and others at the inauguration who prayed in Jesus Christ's name. That was not accidental. And I want to tell you something. Those prayers are all previewed beforehand. And the fact that Donald Trump allowed those people to pray in the name of Jesus Christ speaks volumes. And I commend them for doing that. And I want to tell you this. Your cause in life, whatever it may be, what God's, the victory will come when you determine that you will not stagger at God's promises. You will not stagger at God's word, but you will be strong in faith, believing God's word. And you will raise your children based upon his word. You will operate your business based upon his word. God will do it. Let's stand. It's 12.08. Thank you for your attention. Now, I want to tell you something. I just got a feeling that God's going to save somebody. And here's what I want you to do. We're going home. But if you've asked God to save you, would you please call me and let me know? Because you need to get baptized. And I'd like to baptize somebody in an icy <laughs> baptism. Amen. Oh, that's when it's fun. You really get the whole joke. You really believe you're a new creature when your chest goes underneath the ice water. Amen. No, I'm serious with you. If you get saved, you've asked the Lord to save you, let us know. And and publicly testify to your faith in Jesus Christ. and, And get involved in the body of Christ's work. I love all of you.